السلام علیکم ناظرین آج ہمارے ساتھ ٹریڈ کے ماہر ہمارے مینٹور صفدر سہیل صاحب ہیں اور ان سے ہم جاننے کی کوشش کرتے ہیں کہ ان کے کیا ویوز ہیں ٹیرف اور ٹیرف پالیسی کے حوالے سے اور کس طرح سے وہ ٹریڈ کو دیکھتے ہیں کہ وہ پاکستان کے مسائل حل کر سکتے ہیں میرے لیے استاد کا درجہ ہے مینٹور ہے تو وداؤٹ فردر اڈو صفدر صاحب سنگ which the experience remains relevant even today because we are again talking about now bringing back mm. some elements of that uh, regime. So I was lucky to have that experience because later on in early 90s that department which was called Chief Controller Imports and Exports Office was disbanded mm. by the first U.S. Sharif government <clears throat> as a part of Pakistan Economic Reform Act. So that context is important but I started with that, so I had a taste of the import licensing regime. I uh, started in Multan. It was in 1991. 1985. 1985. I joined after the training at Seven Sons Academy. I joined Freshly brewed. as an nice. assistant controller imports and exports Multan. Spent there two years. Mm-hmm. Started understanding the domestic economy, mm-hmm. licensing regime, major sectors. Multan is an important uh, place. Uh, from there, I moved to Lahore in Export Promotion Bureau, the then Export Promotion Bureau. Oh, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Trade Development mm-hmm. Authority. Uh, to, uh, NPP, Jotha. Yeah, wahan pe I spent three years there. Uh, and uh, then uh, I had an academic bent of mind even uh, then. And uh, uh, I was in charge of Export Advisory cell of Export Motion Bureau Lahore hmm. and had the responsibility to advise the new exporters. So that, that was a good experience that uh, you need to understand the whole system, procedures, rules and hmm. uh, the export potential of Pakistan abroad too. Hmm. I came back in 2000 and went to Kenya as Pakistan's commercial counselor for Eastern and Central Africa based in Nairobi. Uh, stayed there for six years. Africa uh, is important for Pakistan. Hmm. Uh, Uh, so there, you know, I was looking after seven countries. In For Africa. all the African region yeah, and the, commercial counselor. Rwanda, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, Somalia, uh, these uh, places. So I had a good stint. And as a commercial counselor, you actually uh, have to understand both the economies, the economies of your host countries and your own economy so that you could do the matchmaking uh, effectively. Uh, and then there are these regulatory issues uh, what we are going to talk about mm. more today, mm-hmm. that mm. the tariff issues and barriers and non-tariff barriers. So a commercial counselor or commercial attache gets an opportunity to soil his or her hands. So I was also responsible for getting the first review, two-year review of the GSP+. Yes, plus. Uh, and that review essentially was uh, an evaluation of Pakistan's implementation of UN conventions. Mm. So that gave me... Uh, Uh, an opportunity to know the human rights situation also. Hmm. The implementation status of core labor standards, hmm. of core uh, environmental standards and other social and environmental compliances, general human rights situation. Hmm. Organized my posting as PIDE as joint director. Hmm. So I was based there, my office was there. That was a lovely uh, period for me and uh, hmm. uh, that made uh, Mr. Pervez Tahir very happy on that uh, <laughs> There's a person who is a practitioner, has interest in, uh, in, uh, in academics, and now he gets an opportunity to bring academia closer to the practice. We always have a trust that you can do something with these things, but, with he, your exposure, with your work, and your heart in the right place. He always trusts it. Uh, do you know why? Because he himself was that person. <laughs> His heart was in the right place. And he joined academic uh, excellence, one would say. I mean, no match with me, of course. He was no. a giant. 
and uh, then he was as a chief economist he uh, was making policies also so i i think that that model that pervez dhair sab was symbolizing is important it, is, it remains important even now no one is better than you who can <coughs> create that linkage a, a layer of questions um your earlier appointment in africa as a commercial counselor uh, trigger one debate that should a bureaucrat be the commercial counselor or a businessman mm-hmm. because trade facilitation and knowing the trade and and protecting the business interest is mm-hmm. something um be always debate for mm-hmm. and uh, businessmen think that it is the bureaucratic hurdles which are not creating a good impetus and they are not giving us some boost in trade mm-hmm. so what do you think uh, well you see the expectations of the business community need to be respected uh the expectations could be uh unrealistic to the extent that uh, Uh, all that com- a commercial counselor needs to do even if you do all that in an excellent way still the exports to that particular country can go down or up uh, so uh, the process is important the channel is important uh, and i i remember what a bureaucrat can do what the businessman cannot uh, you see if you are talking about the choice between posting a bureaucrat as a as a commercial counselor commercial or somebody who is facilitating trade yeah, but these are no, not two candidates to be posted uh, there are three basically one is that you appoint a commerce and trade officer as a commercial attache oh wow the second is that you appoint a non commerce and trade let's say income tax officer mm. or uh, another service accounts officer or whatever information officer as a commercial counselor and you appoint a businessman as a commercial counselor uh we have experimented uh, times and again with the with the third option mm. uh, but no significant mm. uh, uh, difference but many problems in fact uh the jury is open on on this that whether commerce and trade officer do better uh, in case of us for example they have this foreign commercial services which is a unified service in this sense that their officers who go abroad they work in trade development authority in case of pakistan mm-hmm. when they come back home or in france uh, let's say uh, or in uh, japan or in, uh, in korea so uh, these are the officers who accumulate their experience over a life span and they deliver they understand business very well so uh, i am not opposed to the posting of a non cnt officer abroad provided with this posting he is absorbed into the commercial development system and then he spends rest of his the life the type of the training yeah. that you had and the exposure not every bureaucrat is fortunate enough to have that type so of it takes time uh, as a commerce and trade officer when i went abroad i had already spent 15 years uh, in different assignments and mm-hmm. ministry of commerce new businesses uh sectors well knew the business people chambers etc but one thing is interesting in my case that uh, uh during my posting in kenya uh i spent bulk of time with two investors who were from the private sector so now that's a different level of analysis in the sense that uh, whether having an investor from private sector is better for promoting the business or a traditional uh, diplomat uh there i think i uh, would say that uh, the legitimacy of a private sector businessman investor comes from his work in commercial so usually they would be very pushy they would work very hard but having said that uh, our general investors also are these days much more aware of the importance of the work of the commercial counselors they encourage them support them a lot so that 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 works but and what do you think when you look back that why pakistan has been unable to increase its exports and we are unable to diversify our exports yeah and that, depending that, upon us specifically for exports market yeah that is a primary question which uh, every commerce and trade officer needs to answer and ministry of commerce needs to answer and government of pakistan at a larger level because promoting business interest is something 
uh, which businessmen thinks that they can do better? Yeah, business interest uh, at the firm level is obviously to uh, earn more profits. Mm. Uh, but if you take the whole sector, uh, exports can be, and uh, it has been a case with many uh, countries that exports become an engine of growth. Uh, this did not happen. Mm. We were early uh, globalizers. We were pioneers in liberalizing mm. our trade with this trust and with this hope that uh, exports would become an engine of Pakistan's growth, growth mm. which did not happen. Happened. Now, that was a very expensive mistake. Had we not had this presumption or, or idealistic expectation, we would not have liberalized the way we did. Mm. We liberalized with a big bag. We were mm. part of the first cohort of 32 countries mm. who uh, joined the WTO. But when the actual competition came, we discovered that we were not that competitive. So there, I think the primary uh, reason uh, for our not being competitive, uh, starting with our uh, manner of trade liberalization, there, I think the knowledge part was missing. We did not understand our sectors well. We meaning by Ministry of Commerce, of course and other ministries, uh, Ministry of Industries, Production, Provincial Governments, we should have developed systematic sectoral analysis. We, we had some consult. You see, when uh, we were uh, working out the implications of WTO agreements, we had consultative meetings, but consultative meetings among government servants of different ministries who attend one meeting, then in the next meeting somebody else mm -hmm. comes. So our academia was not really geared up or you can say that there was a disconnect between the academia and the government that we did not prepare very well. And we did uh, keep a lot of water in, uh, in giving protections in general, as was the fashion at that time in developing uh, countries. Um, but our businesses were not very competitive. Uh, government uh, lost the balance between facilitation, development and regulation. Uh, competitiveness does have an aspect of standards uh, which the government needs to uh, impose, one can see. You see that this belongs to the category of regulations. At least clearly defined rules must be there. And standards. And you impose that. You say that we would not allow any substandard good to go abroad, for example and then preparing the country for that. So our infrastructure for development of standards has been uh, poor. Uh, our businessmen had a habit to uh, to depend on subsidies uh, in different ways and means. Uh, we have allowed certain sectors to hide their inefficiencies uh, behind this infant industry argument, giving them unnecessarily high protections. In the evening sector, for example, uh, so host of factors uh, and we did not learn from our competitors that how, let's say, Far East, how was China or Vietnam, uh, they were managing their competitiveness. We also had uh, one important ingredient in place in theory, which was a free uh, foreign direct investment regime. So it was a very, very lucrative regime without any checks, no capital controls, 100% ownership, 100% repatriation of profits. But we could never ask them or force them. But we needed to force them to transfer the technology, to use the local resources, to be export-oriented. So we gave huge protections. Uh, so liberalizing the capital account first and extent of the liberalization in yeah. capital account without looking at without, uh, their own com competencies yeah. in rules, regulations and imposing your terms. You see, the value at look, you see, you give a lot of incentives to FDI, okay, fine. But the other side of equation is the local value added of the FDI in terms of technology transfer, local use of human resource, uh, exports, uh, respect for environment, uh, local uh, natural resources. Uh, so we did not do that. Uh, take the example of synthetic fiber. 
So now we gave them huge protections. They developed into monopolies mm. and synthetic fiber was always expensive. And we developed a romantic attachment with the cotton as a natural fiber. The mm. word changed, uh, the, the pattern of use changed. And we were uh, just uh, playing under the quotas which were mm. there. And when MSA came, the quota went away, we, we went down. So that way, there are a lot of factors, but the, the thing is that we needed to learn from our competitors and be selective, you see. We Lekin, don't have the industrial policy for example. Sadhguru Sahib, I don't think that this is something I think that we don't know about it. We never graduated from agro-based industry to electric and electronics, which is a scale of our industrialization. We've never been graduated. और हमें 22 खानदानों का महबूबुल हक से बेहतर कौन बता गए थे वही लोग थे फ्यूडल वही इंडस्ट्रियलिस्ट और रजालवी की जो बुक है ओलिगार्क स्ट्रक्चर सो वी नो ये कहना मुझे कुछ आपको नहीं लगता कि वी आर नॉट जस्टिफाइंग इन सेइंग कि जी हम अपनी डेप्थ को नहीं जानते थे हमें पता था अपनी वीकनेसेस का बट वी वर कंफाइंड टू द एक्सटेंड कि अल्लाह का शुक्र है बहुत अच्छा चल रहा है अमेरिकन एड वॉज देयर वी हैव सम गुड रिसोर्स कमिंग इन एंड वी बिन कम्फर्टेबली वेल एट दैट टाइम इन द रीजन सो ट्रेड वॉज नेवर बिन द प्रायरिटी वी ओपन अप एंड वी वॉन्ट टू बी विद विद द वेव ऑन दैट सेट दैट इज अविटी सम हाउ विद द पॉलिसी मेकर्स गोइंग विद द वेव एंड इंटरेस्ट लॉबीज बोथ and uh, lack of long term vision and lo- lack of integration between the trade as a sector and the other sectors which for example is domestic commerce uh, so they uh, you are very right that if you have to identify macro issues so all these issues played a part the the behavior part is extremely important if if certain business lobby export lobbies are comfortable with their way of making money, uh, they would continue with that. Uh, it, it's the uh, government here and the state here which realizes that this is not sustainable. And the time has... And the bureaucrats were not smart enough in understanding? Is this what yeah, we are... I think your comment, uh, I remember, is relevant that we were having other vents of growth. Hmm. Export was not our major, major event, event, which would become a national concern. Uh, we were extracting value, let's say, from agriculture and uh, exporting on easy terms, quotas, and uh, we were doing all uh, interesting things. Uh, so we had these different events, money coming from geostrategic uh, interplay, from remittances, etc. So... Uh, that that uh, and certainly at some day we said now we have been signatory of WTO and now trade as an engine of growth and we have to rely on liberalization of trade and now you have to gear up the whole economy after wasting a lot of money time yeah you see I mean the the, the narrative of uh, open trade and competitiveness which many of our academics mm. still beat to the tune of this uh, drum uh, this is this has hurt us a lot uh, openness in trade in our case uh, has not helped openness can help if you can manage its implications if you can use it to your own advantage now you are saying that we want to do competitive import substitution you should have done it in 90s then and put in place the necessary uh, where with all and tools to uh, do that so in that context one can say that um, uh, the same treatment has been received by international trade or external sector as in other areas now which we are discovering bit by bit and even now i would say we talk about the significance of exports more from the concerns of current account deficit not as an engine of growth because uh, whatever trade we have let's not talk about because that the, whatever the money is coming mm-hmm. now is not there and now we have to rely on exports or the remittances yeah you see i mean basically this is the uh, current account deficit compulsion that we want to have more export mm-hmm. and we want to we don't want to restrict imports as such mm-hmm. 
we want to restrict imports because it uh, creates an imbalance. So still, I would say that we are not thinking we, straight. We don't print dollars. So we yes, have also, to earn. Uh, yeah. But still, if our country, certain sectors have an export potential, can be made competitive, we must not uh, uh, give up this opportunity. But then again, I would come to the main question, which is not there in the old thing, that when we went for liberalization, we also internalized the uh, narrative that we don't have to comply with environment or labor standards or uh, uh, valuation uh, proper and bringing back the national use. Even certifications, ISO certifications and so all see, these things. When you're exporting, what are you doing? You are exporting national value. Now, that value should come back in terms of dollars, all of it, that is number one. And then the distributive aspect of the, are you paying minimum wages to your employees, for example? Uh, so that way uh, we uh, accepted a crude kind of liberalization, which basically meant no regulations of any kind and you are allowed to make money as you feel like and you make money from the subsidies by name, not paying properly to the labor, not giving up... Uh, any consideration to the environment. So that that is... The Competition the between the bottom tier of the world for producing cheap things for the developed world. This is something, the narrative, which is there for some time and those who've been criticizing Washington consensus mm -hmm. and all these documents, they think that trade has making these developing economies or less developed econ economies competing um, for selling their products. Mm. Fair enough, but what is the alternative? What to do? You see, you can either become the part of the world or you can lead the world. You see, there many, we, we don't have the both situations. There are many examples, positive examples, where they can, uh, they can retain value within their country and they can export also if they have uh, the possibility. Now, this very argument that our labor is cheap uh, uh, and that is our comparative advantage. This is basically wrong. Uh, the, now the situation is, you see, I mean, we have continued with this, these kind of uh, myths and narratives, and now we, are, uh, we have reached at a situation which is very difficult uh, conceptually in the sense that a uh, lot of other countries went also uh, in terms of developing the capacity for cheap exports, so in that band, there is an oversupply of manufacturing goods. China has a huge uh, export capacity. Uh, India uh, has huge manufacturing capacity, but as compared to China, their competitiveness is far less, and they are also stuck with that surplus capacity. Now, uh, if you remain in that optic of... Uh, uh, paying minimum to the labor and on the basis of that to have, you see, competitiveness, labor rates does play a role, uh, uh, provided you know the balance that minimum labor has to be paid. The uh, competitiveness should come from the uh, specialization, from sophistication of your exports. Uh, but now what is happening is another element which is much less discussed in Pakistan is that the appetite of imports in our traditional markets is going down otherwise. You see, US and EU are our major export destinations. Now in EU, uh, now the big time discussion is degrowth, that this level of consumption, you see the, the feeling against fast fashion, for example, uh, they want to bring social back into the equation and they want to curb uh, this, this year, uh, uh, I was uh, reading in Guardian that many people as a New Year resolved, the ladies have resolved that instead of wearing X number of uh, new ready-made garments, I would half my requirement. Recycling the old clothes because of the environmental thing. And ecological justice mm. that we should not. So, and, But don't you think that this is because of the, the Chinese rise in the competitiveness and export market because Europe and USA is not 
uh, good enough in competing with China in the cheap products. That's the third phenomenon, which is more pronounced in U.S. That's what they call homeland economics. Economics. Uh, after Ukraine and the disruption of supply chains and realizing that uh, how much do we depend on China, uh, now this uh, talk of nearshoring and importing from friends and uh, bringing back mm. manufacturing. Now, uh, this uh, basically is a big turn, uh, and that turn is the coming back of industrial policy. Now, uh, Bidenomics, so-called, uh, the documents in, of Bidenomics, the central pillar is the industrial policy. policy. Now, this word, which was considered a bad word, and in Pakistan it's still considered a bad word if you suggest that we should have a, an industrial yes, policy, policy, which we don't have since ages. Uh, people say that, what are you talking about? But uh, in France, in EU, in UK, industrial policy is at the heart of efforts to rejuvenate the economies. And bringing back manufacturing is one part because of that. Because employment generation is uh, the critical issue. Jobs. And, and the joblessness. Stable, and Stable jobs. Uh, because this is something, a crucial point. So this, this, these are this, this combination of factors that you want to import only from your friends, that you want to produce more locally, and you want people to consume less would result in a much lower appetite for exports from countries like Pakistan. For example, ready-made garments is one of our major export items. Home textile is one of our major export items. If people don't change up their bed sheets very frequently or don't, don't put on new ready-made garments, then our exports would go down. Uh, and then keep it in mind that manufacturing capacity is abundant and uh, many countries now uh, India, Pakistan, India and China do have the state capacity to support their export sectors. Now, our capacity to support continue giving subsidies to export sectors is finished. When we, we don't have the fiscal space for the that. The duty drawback facility type of a things have their own implications and problems created. But don't you think that the textile sector never graduated from bed linen and all these type of things? And they've never been into the value added. Uh, we never have chemical industries. We never have a nephtha cracker at home. So one type of a argument, yes, um, the size and the exports market is shrinking, but we never been graduated as well. Well, you see, textile is a very large sector, still the largest export sector, and uh, cotton is one of our major cash mm -hmm. crops. It is an advantage, though uh, I've said that we should have uh, done better on synthetic textiles. But having said that, I think the uh, performance of textile sector overall uh, does does create a lot of questions that you are uh, suggesting. But uh, uh, the sector has many pockets of excellence also. Look at the interlude for Faisalabad, the socks, for example, uh, or the top exporters of ready-made garments who still manufacture for the, top the brands. The interlude is creating uh, organic socks as well uh, on the finest of the brand huge quantity but how many of the type of the industrialists we have like interlo now, that's what i'm saying that we do have pockets we have uh, uh, ready made garment exporters uh, who are good making for big brands but if you compare at the scale then we have a problem in in, in socks uh, I, I think uh, out of any 10 socks maybe 3 4 are from pakistan uh, that's good but hosiery, so that is basically doing well in hosiery. Very but if you look at chief you, type of the products, in if you look at the product ladder, uh, interloop I think is is interloop is yeah, one of exception. But uh, by and large, yeah, you see there um, we are uh, more active in chief brands, uh, not in specialized brands. Uh, but that's a bigger dynamics that the big fashion. I say brands. it like we we sell more at Primark rather than selling at Selfridges. Yeah, I uh, uh, so, <laughs> so oh, maybe you can <laughs> quite out the difference and so, seen lines in front of Primark in Brussels also, <laughs> <laughs> and then and, and they, they they've been making money for selling one dollar uh, yeah, commodities yes. and and uh, they say the selling one people. one suit in a year and selling thousands of yeah. slippers or sneakers of one dollar. 
would make the difference. But there, you know, I mean, uh, now with pressures, with less subsidies, more competition, the firms who can manage their... You really think that our labor is cheap? Our with the skill is. set and with the type of the productivity we have, you think yeah. that we are competitive with Bangladesh? We are exporting cotton and they are making money out of that cotton. You see, this argument... Uh, presented by many uh, that uh, what we pay to our labor is okay, keeping in mind their productivity. This I find very problematic. Mm. We would never be able to get out of this again check situation that we would not pay our labor as long as they are not competitive mm. uh, as compared to some uh, standards. Minimum salary has to be paid. Uh, the company internationally spent 6% on the training of their employees. Uh, our industry should go to long-term contracts, should take care of their social security, should invest on their training. They would definitely, I mean, they, they, there is no dearth of knowledge linking comprehensive social security with labor productivity. But labor productivity is one part of overall competitiveness. What is the productivity of the managers, of the owners, of the vision, of the technology they are using? You see, in, in China, for example, they went for technological sectoral roadmaps where they revamped all the sectors. And, well, they have a uh, facility of having state-owned enterprises which can lead the process. So uh, here, when you say that we should have given importance to other sectors, that's a very correct observation that why our chemicals could not grow as much as they should have. So... There, if you have limited amount of subsidies and limited attention by the government, then the bigger energy, bigger industry players would be able to hog more attention. So, but that's where the public policy comes in. That our public policy planners should know Pakistan economy better. And now the traditional notions of comparative advantage have changed. In inefficiencies in the system and curtailing the labor cost is not the right way of action. This is what you are yeah, saying. You see, so that, that should be non-negotiable. Not negotiable. Uh, minimum labor, minimum wages for labor, Living and wages, comprehensive social security. security. That, is, that has to be Close there. that factory which uh, does not, not do that. So, uh, even the environment things, if they are not implying. When, when you want to connect trade and development, what are the main channels for development that is through these channels that we're talking about? So, so when we talk about the inefficiencies, tariff is another type of protectionism given to the local industry. And we are not opening up competition. There are monopolies. There are few firms who are having 60-70% of the production. And then there are small and medium enterprises who have been not benefiting from all these tariffs, regulatory duties, even duty drawbacks. Mm -hmm schemes and all these things. How you see all these things? Yeah, there I, th I think our uh, performance, one would say, is uh, pretty depressing, uh, one would say. And I started with this optimistic expectation while we were liberalizing. Uh, but uh, Pakistan has always kept certain sectors under very high protection, auto sector, uh, for example. Uh, so, uh, now it's well known, I need not even talk about that, that what is what is happening and how important this sector could have been as a leader in the engineering sector uh, had we not relaxed the deletion requirements uh, and uh, had we not continued with the protectionist regime and not allowed them to uh, earn unholy profits. Even in the subsectors like trucking, which is extremely important, you see, personal car is another matter, but mm. trucking and buses, public transport, there also these protections have uh, played havoc with. In our neighborhood, a truck is available for one third of the price. Why not here? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is another uh, segment, very large segment. Uh, Trucking, highly, tractors, tube wells, yeah, these other, all other are... Than, other than uh, auto sector I'm talking about. Uh, these multinationals who manufacture for the local market, uh, import their 
uh, ingredients at a very low cost and uh, have uh, high entry barriers for other companies. Uh, and they have uh, been earning uh, huge profits. And as our uh, different policy spheres are not integrated, we have never questioned the profits. We have never questioned the pricing practices of the industry. Uh, why milk is now at the, you see, and recently in social media, they have changed. The flashed that mm. the one and a half liter in Pakistan is around 600, and in India it's 175. Uh, the report that the, the, the milk is expensive yeah. than so, France. Yeah. So there, I, I think the uh, we we thought in our own imagination that as if tariff policy is only for uh, imported products, but Within the domestic commerce, we have different kinds of protection and our National Tariff Commission still, when they think about trade defense and trade remedy laws, they think in the context of 70s and 80s. Uh, they, for example, take literally no interest in domestic commerce. And if you talk to them, they would say that it's Competition Commission which would do that. Uh, and if you talk to Competition Commission, they have their own story to uh, tell. tell. Uh, so there, in that sense, I think uh, uh, our protection policies have been problematic. Uh, one reason for that is that uh, we allowed the what we call forum hopping to the lobbies. Mm. That if they think that they can get better deal from Engineering Development Board, they would uh, get the uh, amendment in the Pakistan Custom Act that uh, the decision would be taken by EDB, not... National Tariff Commission, for example, uh, and our Ministry of Industries have been at times protecting some sectors, uh, uh, perhaps unreasonably. So there, I, I think we have allowed the tariff policy to be uh, fragmented, one can say, uh, even at the sectoral uh, level. Don't you think that there are delays in implementing the decisions like if a study takes two or three years, like if the countervailing duties and the anti-export bias or or anti-dumping duties, if you go to the National Tariff Commission and they have to do the investigation, then it takes two to three years to complete a study and um, businessmen can't wait and they just go to the cabinet and try to have a regulatory duty or the government wants to extract revenues and they go to the FBR to issue an SRO. So don't you think that there again a capacity issue which is there and um, we've been not effective with these institutions? Well, uh, I, you see being in commerce um, one knows all these colleagues who have been working at different times in the National mm -hmm. Tariff Commission good offices, quality offices and working well and hard many times obstructed by the courts, for example, or by the hesitation of the industry to share the data. So mm. there, there are a lot of factors which are responsible for the... I'm uh, intentionally delay. not talking about I, courts. I, but by, large, <laughs> by and large, one would say that uh, the delay is not intentional, but the one critical factor which NTC, National Tariff Commission, is uh, perhaps responsible for, if you compare the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, and U.S., they, uh, I, I visited, when I visited them long time back, at that time they had 300 economists who were continuously working on American economy, domestic sectors, international trade, and producing analyses on a regular basis and predicting the trends and vulnerabilities and feeding the commissioners, the trade commissioners. That we have not done. Uh, you we, can't find any sectoral data here in Pakistan. Yeah. So uh, that way, our NTC should have its own... Uh, you see, take, for example, tiles, for example. If there is a complaint that the surge in imports of textiles and uh, a complaint goes to uh, National Tariff Commission, they should have a study already and they should hmm. not take more than a few not days in concluding that this is actually true and then they get the data from the complainant which they have to get and the other country and in three, four months you can come And up. this reactionary mode, once they receive the complaint, then they start investigation and then this they try to... This is a big problem. <laughs> yes. This, this is perhaps the Rather biggest than, problem. Yes. 
the biggest problem. They've been but, waiting. But it's an historical problem. Now you, uh, this problem exists in so long that uh, now we are having its uh, bad implications. This will not go away in a day, but even now they should be able to uh, not only uh, study international trade, understand domestic commerce also. The protections in domestic commerce work in a very different way. Uh, its uh, tariff is one level. There are other forms of protections, and we need to get out of our trade remedy laws. We should have trade defense and trade remedy laws for domestic commerce also. Mm -hmm. uh, and they should work closely with competition commission. Only then they would be able to reduce rent in the business and uh, masking inefficiencies and violating consumer rights. So you think that uh, not doing our homework results in the quick fixes of the problem which created another set of problems. Yeah, as you said, the businessmen would not wait for NTC. They would change the forum. Forum and then they go. Mm. Which may create, you see, which creates the hazard of uh, a wrong incentive structure. So there the powerful sectors would be able to defend themselves and perhaps uh, to protect themselves more than they are needed to. But the toy industry in Pakistan has disappeared and nobody even noticed. Noticed. The yeah. same is for the many industries, like the cycle industry, so Harab cycle, we always exactly. had, and Chinese now it cycle. cannot even compete with the Chinese cycle, which is affordable. And, and uh, what do you think that uh, FTA, Chinese Free Trade Agreement, and as somebody who's been um, uh, CPAC, um, and director and looking after all these things. Mm -hmm. You think that there were some loopholes while negotiating FTA with China and now the revisions are there on the table, what we should be doing with FTA? Yeah, you see the, uh, the multiple levels of analysis here. Uh, we entered into negotiation with China early harvest long time before China Pakistan Economic Corridor was there. So that is one. Uh, the early harvest was negotiated. I would not like to say that it was negotiated hurriedly or whatever. The results were not good in case of Pakistan, uh, you can say, and then we went for the full uh, FTA. My own understanding is that China is such a big partner. Had we understood China better, uh, trading with China, uh, even on FTA terms is mm. problematic, particularly when you do not work out your sectors of export interest and do not insist on the Chinese for quotas and for special dispensations. Uh, all that Pakistan produces is produced by China also. So if you separate import interest of Pakistan, which is defensive, mm. where NTC comes in, uh, and we did not give a lot of concession there, though in the import uh, sector, but Chinese are so competitive that we should have very high, robust uh, walls against Chinese imports, or we should have brought in, you see, now we are talking about investment-led trade policy or investment-led uh, tariff policy, but then we should have uh, negotiated, told, them. negotiated with the Chinese that, uh, bring your manufacturing facilities here for the local market and export also, instead of uh, staying with the very superficial trade integration of reducing barriers here. You see that that was... A and assuming that China produce and it travel all through from Pakistan to Gulf or to Africa to all these cheap markets, mm -hmm. would have been better that given incentive in SSEs so, to Chinese to come yeah, and set up. In that FTA, we should have brought our own industrial policy, policy. to that FTA. Yeah. But those were the days when it was haram to talk about <laughs> industrial <laughs> policy. <you know? laughs> so uh, we had that lopsided one. Uh, and then we had an opportunity to rectify uh, when CPAC came, but there was no integration of uh, approaches no practical relationship between Planning Commission who was dealing with CPAC and Ministry of Commerce. 
uh, when I went to, uh, when I was uh, consult doing consultation on China Parks and Economic Corridor long term plan, which had industrial mm. parks as its pillar. And the Ministry of Commerce said that you're the first person who has come. And so that was in April 2016. And uh, CPAC was there for the last three years at that time, you know, around right. three years. And uh, Commerce didn't know what was happening. So even after we were negotiating the long-term plan, the it was hard to bring in trade because we had already agreed that the existing trade arrangements and agreements would continue. So there we agreed with Chinese on some such things which we should not have done that. Mm. China, China Parks and Economic Corridor was basically a long-term plan for trade and investment integration. But we just focused on the investment part, more so energy part, mm. and put trade on the site. So that, that, that was an opportunity which was missed in 2013 and still is not there. When the government changed in 2013, I was still at the Planning Commission. Then the new Chinese investor at that time said that we are bringing in a new phase and in this phase we would uh, allocate enough resources to socioeconomic development and exports. But after that, gradually the mention of exports as a pillar of China Parks and Economic Corridor disappeared. The socioeconomic funding they were already giving, so they gave $1 billion, and that also became a routine. Hmm. And now we are talking again about the second phase, and we are talking again about hmm. energy, hmm. and trade is no more, uh, not there. Part of the discussion. Yeah, and uh, from Chinese side also, oh, there's no mention of that. So we still are not very clear that what are our expectations in terms of our exports and imports. Uh, there could be voluntary restrictions on Chinese imports into Pakistan from their side and there could be positive measures to buy more from Pakistan from the Chinese uh, side. But that's not on the table, I fear. Neither. We've been discussing about the currency in yuan, trading in Chinese currency. That, I think there are the many swaps and mm -hmm. there we are making uh, progress. But the thing is that you see once you have such a heavy uh, trade imbalance uh, in order to pay our imports in yuan, we need to earn yuans that you would earn only through exports. And you think that the agricultural commodities like fruit and with the agricultural meat and all these things, uh, we cannot uh, plug this deficit? They're rather small. Meat is big. Meat is big, but then we, we used to have restrictions on our uh, meat. And, and don't we need to collaborate with China, like the storage, quarantine facilities and all these things? Packaging and, and uh, marketing? All these things help uh, in small time, but if we want a major breakthrough, then more and more Chinese manufacturing has to come here. Uh, Chinese have to agree to export less to Pakistan and become stakeholders in Pakistan's local production to make it as a uh, staging for exports to other uh, areas. Uh, and then there are larger issues, you know, the, for example, the energy costs in, in the country. Uh, the CPAC has contributed to the escalation of energy costs, mm. though Chinese invested in the context of our IPP projects, but still uh, that's being talked about these days also. Uh, these days it's not possible to talk about the exports and imports in isolation. So the trade, investment and aid, they all have to go hand in hand and there I think they need to uh, revision China Parks and Economic Corridor with long-term plan. Previously, the long-term plan which we were working on, which the Chinese did not accept, we were talking about concrete targets after 15 years. And you see, you know, Dr. Saiba, what, what is the use of an FTA mm. if at the end of the uh, day, let's say 15 years, you cannot have a convergence, some convergence between the annual incomes of citizens. So that is the real objective. So. That, that is the revisioning. The standard of living has to improve in, uh, as a result of the trade. Incomes. And if you've been given the task by the coming government or this government that you have to devise the tariff policy, what are one, two, three key steps? Yeah, you see, the 
tariff policy has to be defensive. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Uh, th that's number one. One should be very so clear. So you, you want protectionism there? I don't want to use these terms anymore. Mm -hmm. See, that that's what is needed, that if uh, NTC is serious... Protecting what? There are two in that three. <laughs> yeah, that again is a very general comment. Mm. What needs to happen is that there needs to be a group of experts who are not fond of these terms, uh, who have abandoned these narratives, who are... And this ready to look at Pakistan mm -hmm. economy the way it is today and bring in all the policies on the table. You see, what, what do you think? Uh, only tariff policy reform would uh, deliver. No, you have to revisit your uh, uh, foreign exchange uh, cert also. You have to revisit your FDI policy uh, also. Uh, bring in uh, strobus regulations with a proper regulatory capacity uh, and then see that our national tariff tariff policy, which is there for now, for one the of the component of the whole regulatory reform, yeah, which is there for for all these years, there is now a tariff board also. Why nothing could happen in four or five years, because of the deeper structural changes which have taken place in the country and in narrative, we have we are scaring everybody, importers as well as it exporters and investors and. These things should be taken away from the usual common discourses and serious people from the business, from academia, from policy community and government, both from the federal government, ministries relevant, and the provincial government. They should sit and work and uh, they should have some vision of bringing uh, back some kind of uh, stability on certain principles that you don't export for the sake of exports. You don't export for the sake of earning foreign exchange only. You see, this growthism has to go away. Mm -hmm. That you can, to get a few more dollars, which you can get from other sources also, you bleed your national resources in the form of exports just to get foreign exchange or just to let some exporters earn money. You see, why, are, why have we internationalized wheat, for example? This is the most stupid policy that we have adopted. I mean, you have serious food security issues. And uh, due to the lobbies, you have internationalized uh, uh, wheat. Uh, you have financialized wheat and you have internationalized wheat. And you are already having issues. And in a few years' time, you would have much bigger issues. Rice internationalization was okay. We could manage because that's not a staple food as such. So now there are bigger issues if you want to keep national value within the national boundaries. You think you need to think more about the domestic commerce first and domestic sustainability of domestic trade and commerce and development and then link it with, with exports. Thank you very much, Savdasha. We learned a lot. And the key message is that uh, tariff policy can't work in isolation, effective regulatory framework which emphasizes domestic commerce is the key to success. With this, I thank you all for listening. Please give your feedback. <laughs>